Uh, well, so my name is Christian. Well, many people have pro uh, problems with, uh, with my surname here. My surname is Guajardo. So if you find a Spanish surname with, with J here, it sounds like more or less when you are sick, like <laughs> <laughs> So it's Guajardo. Well, well, I am a researcher from this university, but, but not in this campus. I'm a researcher in Ban Kun Tien campus. And it's pretty exciting time for me this time because it's the first time we, we do or we work actually with an, an open source project, actually based on an open source project that is existing now. Uh, so, well, I will show with you and share with you my, my experience and the experience of my students with this, with this project. So, as you see here, it is building a wax printer. Well, actually, we took a 3D printer and we turned it into a wax printer. And for using it in the lab, I work in sensor technology laboratory and we uh, fabricate prototypes of sensors and develop sensors. So, mostly what we do is chemical analysis and, and this is the printer for, this, for fabricating this kind of devices for chemical analysis. So, today I will talk about well, mostly two things. One, probably many of you don't, don't know about chemical analysis, so I will give a short motivation of, uh, for chemical analysis. The current technology that you may have seen in, in the market. The, the new technology that is not in the market that, that we are working in the research. And how to build this technology. This technology is, is called paper-based microfluidics. And mostly for, for fabricating these, we need uh, wax printers. So that's why our project. And then why, why to build the wax printer? And then we go into some, some details of, of the projects that we did with our students. And then some f uh, final words regarding uh, like open source and, and our experience. So this is more or less what you, what you can find now in the market. And chemical analysis normally was, well, in, still now, but more in the past was done mostly in the labs. But from time, some, some, some years ago, this uh, uh, analysis, these tests, have been moving from the lab to devices that, that you, can, you can buy in, in the pharmacy or do, that you can hold in your hand. For example, these three are the three most, most famous, probably. The first one is a urine test, the second is uh, the pregnancy test, and the third is a, a glucose sensor for patients with diabetes. So in this one, if you have a sample of urine, instead of sending to the lab to analyze, you just buy this strip, you put your sample of urine here, and it will flow. And when it flows, it will change colors here. Each, each of these squares yeah, measures one, one component, let's say, of, of the urine. And depending on the intensity of the color, then you will know whether you have more or less of one of these components in urine. For example, albumin or glucose or protein or whatever. Yeah. And <clears throat> another one that is probably most common is the pregnancy test. Here, the woman puts a sample in the in the pregnancy test, and if it appears this this bar here then it means that she's pregnant. If it doesn't appear, it means that she's not. And it measures some proteins that are in, present in the body of the woman. This one, as I told you before, is for the uh, patients with diabetes. This one is not as simple as these two because it requires an electronic component, which delivers the, the result in numbers, how much glucose you have in your, in your blood. And the way it works is just to put a sample of, of blood here and, and it tells you how much blood, uh, sugar you have in your blood. So these three kind of devices are, are quite simple in general because the, the sample that you put in these devices either st stays still, like in this case in the sensor, or moves only in one direction and the detection is pretty straightforward. You just put the sample there and immediately you measure the, the concentration of, of, of the analyte that, that you, you are interested in. These kind of devices, they, they don't perform analysis in, in several steps. They just do it in one step. So complex analytes that require, let's say, filtration or pre-processing before measurement, you cannot do it with, with them. 
So this is where the new technology comes. So uh, in difference from this one with the previous, well, the, the name of this technology is called uh, paper-based microfluidics. Well, this technology allows you, in, in difference with the previous one, that the flow here is not, not linear, it's, uh, or, or the liquid doesn't stay still in a single spot. You can direct the flow of liquid in your device to different stages, where the, each, each stage of the device perform different uh, steps in a complete uh, analysis or, or test of, of some sample in, in, of some protein or, 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 or molecule in, in your samples. So in this way, the, the sample can, can follow very intricate patterns to go from stage to stage. And the way to direct the, the liquid in, in these devices is by using channels. And these channels, flow in paper in defined directions because these, these, these channels are made from, from a hydrophobic barrier. Yeah, it means a barrier that doesn't let water or liquid go out. Uh, one very simple material for fabricating these barriers is wax because wax is hydrophobic and it won't let the liquid go out from, from the tracks that you define. So for example, in this case, the, the sample doesn't flow linearly. This one detects uh, glucose in blood as well. And in difference with the previous one, this one is, is optic, not, it's not electronic. So you put the sample here in the middle. In the middle, it has a lot of antibodies that agglutinate uh, the red blood cells. So you can somehow separate the plasma from the big bodies of the blood. And then uh, the plasma goes to each of these uh, ends of the device where it has a control signal, and it has the signal of your measurement in triplicate, which is different from the previous one. The previous one, this electronic version, on, only gives you one measurement, but this one gives you the measurement in triplicate, so you can make sure the, the measurement is, is more accurate. And Well, visually, it can give you a, a, an estimate of the amount of uh, glucose that you have in blood. But if you want something more quantitative, like with a specific number, the people couple these things with mobiles. Everyone nowadays, almost everyone, <laughs> has mobiles. And you can analyze the, the intensity of the color by using applications on the mobile. And that will give you a, a number of how much glucose you have in your body. This is more or less the kind of intricate patterns that, that the, the, the fluid can, can follow within the device. This device is printed in a sheet of paper, yeah? But this sheet of paper with these nine squares can be folded, yeah? So the sample comes and passes through each of these, well, following the arrows here. It, it passes through each of these different squares, and in each of these different squares, they, they perform different stages of the process of analysis of, of, the, of the sample that you want to measure. This one also detects glucose and, and protein in, in urine. Yeah, it's much more complex than the previous one. And this one also, it detects uh, nitrite in water. Yeah, that, that may be dangerous. And this one detects in, in, in a sevenfold. So each of these uh, circles here very likely uh, allows a detection of nitrite in different ranges. Yeah. So it can span a, a wider range for detection. And also, the, the color here indicates the intensity of the, of the analyte, nitrate. And you can make it quantitative by using mobiles. So for this, we need wax to fabricate these kind of devices. And how, are, how they are fabricated, actually, the process is very simple. That's why people, researchers, are moving to this platform and experimenting with this technology of paper-based microfluidics. So what do we do? We just draw a pattern in the computer. And later comes the magic here. We print it with a wax printer. There are commercial wax printers where you can print these patterns. And after printing, uh, the pattern will be printed on top of the surface of paper. So in order to let the, the liquid flow the direction, specified by the wax patterns, you need to reflow this wax. 
So how do you do that? You melt it in an oven or in a hot plate so the wax enters the paper and defines the channels inside the paper. Yeah, this is very simple and the process of fabrication is super short. Uh, well, for that we bought a wax printer. We bought one a couple of years ago and it was working good until we ran into some problems that, well, technical problems of the uh, thermal head. So we called the company once and then they came and they repaired and then a couple of years later, one year actually, uh, we had problems again. So when they come, they said, no, no, we don't have much spare parts now, so you have to wait for a while. And then when we called them the, the third time, then they said, no, no, we don't have the spare parts anymore. And the thing is that uh, Xerox in this case is uh, discontinued the, the fabrication of these, these models. So then we say, well, we buy, we buy a new one then. So we bought a new one. And then this one hasn't run into problems, but we saw also in the web page that Xerox is not fabricating new models anymore. <laughs> and later we wanted to buy uh, wax cubes for printing. And now the, uh, our usual supplier is not providing them anymore. So we are looking for other suppliers. And probably they, they will disappear in some time. So if, if we don't have this anymore, then we cannot do our research anymore. So, so here is where, where free and open source hardware comes to rescue. <laughs> A couple of years ago, I read this book. It's a very good one. I, I recommend it to you. It's called Open Source Lab. And it was very exciting to read it because it, it basically says that you don't need to buy very fancy equipment. You can fabricate your own equipment and set, set it up in your lab. So from, from, this, from this researcher, his, his name is Yushua Pierce. So once I read this book, I was very excited. And later, this was, this was released in 2013. And then in 2016, he, he wrote this paper. It's called Open Source uh, Wax Reprap 3D Printer. And when I saw this one, I thought, wow, well, this is the solution for us. If we can build our, our own wax printer, if we can build our own wax printer, then, then we're safe. And we can maintain the printer by ourselves. So this is what they did. They, they took, uh, well, this is more or less old, right? So they took a, a RepRap a Prusa Mendel, and they modified the extruder here to be able to extrude wax. Yeah, this is more or less how the, the, the extruder looks like. And well, I saw this paper, we had the, the idea to, to build our own, but we didn't, hand, we didn't have hands <laughs> to build the thing. And luckily this year, thanks to this program from KMUTT, it's called Taiwan KMUTT Internship Program. We got three students from, from Taiwan during two months in our lab. And when I saw their backgrounds, I thought, well, this is our chance to, to make the project real. So two of them are mechanical engineering, and well, in the program of mechanical engineering, and one in the program of material engineering. So it, it was perfect for the project. So I thank to them for initiating the, the project that, that we hopefully continue and improve. So, it was a challenge for them as well because even when they are mechanical, well, they are in the program of mechanical engineering and they can do these kind of things very, very easily or, or with not much problems, they didn't have much experience on, on programming and in electronics. So it was good experience for them because it is sort of multidisciplinary project for them because they had to get in a bit of informatics and programming and also get into a bit of electronics as well. So they had to study the, the firmware, well, at least the settings of the firmware from Marlin, and adapt it to make their, their extruded works. And this is after, after two months of hard work, <laughs> what they got. Uh, I thought, yeah, this is more or less what I expected, that they could build the machine. But I, I was not sure whether the machine would work properly after these two months. So, well, they did, they did, they worked very hard. They did very well. And the machine is 
partially working so far, but now we have to continue ourselves because they, they returned to, to Taiwan like, like a couple of weeks ago. So the machine now is, is built with uh, Prusa I, Iteration 3, and this is how the, their extruder looks like. We had to modify the parts to, to fit the components that we have in our lab, so we didn't spend much money on this. And it consists of a motor that pushes the, the piston of the syringe, and the outside of the syringe is uh, covered with a copper tube. So the copper tube is connected with a heater, a normal heater of a 3D printer. So the tube hits the syringe, and the syringe contains wax, and when the wax is, is molten, then the piston pushes down. And a couple of days before they left, they tried to, to print wax, actually. The only wax we had at that, at that time in the lab was candle wax. So, well, we tried with that. And the results were not good, because candle wax, from, from the experience we got, melts very quickly, yeah? But also gets cold very quick, quickly as well. So when the, the wax is molten here, and then reaches the, the end of the syringe, it gets cold very fast and blocks the, the tip of the nozzle. So it was very difficult to print with wax, with candle wax at least. And later, uh, well, due to time, mostly, uh, we told the students, okay, well, just try with, with Vaseline, because Vaseline is also oil-based, so it should block water as well, and it is a bit viscous, so probably you, you can print with that. And they tried, and they actually could print the pattern. I don't know whether you see the pattern here. And the other good thing of the, of the 3D printer is that, is that it comes here, yeah, is that it comes here with a, with a heater. So with this heater, we can melt the wax again and reflow it to get inside the paper. So this is how the printed pattern looks like. And after melting, uh, well, you see that the, the wax got, well, the Vaseline in this case got inside the, the paper and could actually uh, fabricate the channels. Later, the students tried with, with liquid here, and the liquid actually could flow but Vaseline is, is, not, is not very good, so some of the, the sample you see that, that went out. So what is remaining for us is to try with different kind of wax. So instead of candle wax, that doesn't work, that because it's too, let's say, it has low in thermal inertia, let's say, and Vaseline, that is, is, is not, it's like very viscous, it's like a paste. These are very two, two very extreme cases, so we would like to try with something like in the middle, like these waxes that, that girls use for, for depilation, or also paraffin wax as well. Yeah, they are more or less in between in, in, in terms of physical characteristics. So we have to try with that first. And well, at least the, the thing is working now. And, well, to close the, the talk, I will give a, a couple of final words. For the students, it was a very good experience because they, they got aware of the importance of free and open source hardware. Because they, they realized that if we build our own machines, then we can give ourselves support of the machines and get more independent from the companies. Also, it was a good experience for them because they required like multidisciplinary knowledge. And in terms of design, they got aware of, of these five, well, these four freedoms from software that we can also apply to hardware. The first one, uh, when you have a design of hardware, you need the freedom to, to make, to make the device. Yeah, and this is related to patents, so they, they got aware of, of patents or patents as well. And second, they, they got all of the information to, to read the, about the design and modify the design. So they got aware also of copyrights, yeah? And, and also regarding copyrights, uh, <coughs> they got aware that the, the formats they were using were not open, so not everyone could uh, read their files if they wanted, so we have to translate it to open, open formats. And also, these open formats would enable other people to modify our design if they wanted. 
So to close the cycle, we still need to put this in the internet so other people can modify our designs and, and complete the cycle. Do, do I still have uh, one or two minutes? Yeah. No? Yeah, two minutes, good. Because I, I want to show you the videos of the, of the printings. These are very short, actually. Oh, where is the VLC? Well, it doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah, I will just double click. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, it was working. But now it's not. Okay, yeah, if, if, it, if it doesn't, then, then don't worry. Yeah. Oh no, it's oh, no, it's not there. No, it's, it's this one. Open with VLC. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, that one. So this is a, a video showing when we are printing candle wax. You see that at, well at the beginning it, it was very liquid. Ah yeah, at the beginning it was very liquid because the temperature was too high, and we couldn't control the printing. And later we decreased the temperature to control a bit better the printer, but still we couldn't control the, the printing correctly. And this is because of the, the temperature that changes too quickly in, in candle wax. And the second one, the second one is when we printed with, with Vaseline, you see that the control is much better. We actually could print. But as I told you before, the problem with, with the Vaseline is that it is not strong enough to contain all of the kind of samples that we use. So that's the reason we have to try other kind of wax. But now we have a good starting point anyway. Well, thank you very much for your attention. And well, if you have any questions, you're welcome to ask. Or if you don't have questions now, you, you can ask me later during the breaks. Thank you very much. <laughs>